first and foremost, there's some things that we need to understand about integration. And so our chair, Dave Smallstig, is with us today to lead that, and I'm certainly honored to hand the stage to you. Very good, very good. Um, after listening to the last several sessions, uh, it's, it's hard to believe we could get deals done. Um, so let, let's, let's get into the fact that a deal is going to be done, um, and we're going to talk about synergy uh, setting. How, how do we set the, the, the target, quantify it, uh, one-time cost, disenergies as well? Um, so my background uh, with FTI, I've been doing this since the late 80s, pretty much uh, since that period of time, acquisitions. Half my career was in corporate doing uh, acquisitions, so negotiating, integrating, buying, uh, some sell, you know, carve-outs at, at that time. Um, well, well, last half of my career, I've uh, been on more of the, uh, the consulting side, global consulting. And we've assembled a panel here today that's going to give us different perspectives. So you know, my, my perspective runs the whole continuum from, you know, the buy side, the sell side, um, you know, the initial pre-LOI, going through that process, through the execution, uh, supporting it or leading it. But we're going to bring different lens to this. We're, we're going to have a uh, sort of a C-suite board level lens. Uh, someone that actually does the, you know, you know hands into the, the, the integration itself in a corporate dev lens. So with that, why don't we just take a minute and introduce ourselves going down the, the line here. Sure. Uh, my name is Eileen Kamrick, and I'm a double graduate of University of Chicago JD MBA. Started my career as an M&A lawyer at Skadden and then went over to the finance side and spent several, many years at Amico, did a lot of uh, transactions there, both acquisitions, divestitures, financings, really around the world, largely to follow Amico's growth in their chemicals business, which at that time was in Europe and in Asia, but also did deals in places like Papua New Guinea and Africa and odd places like that because that's where the oil is. Um, and after that, uh, I've been CFO of both public and private companies. I was CFO of Leo Burnett, when we merged with Darcy McManus and were on the road to going public and sold ourselves to Publicis, I was the CFO of Hydrogen Struggles, where we did a number of acquisitions. And I can talk a little bit about the interesting world of service company acquisitions, because there's no hard assets. The assets go up and down in the elevator every day. And then also, I was CFO of Houlihan Loki, which was I was on the other side of that, because we were obviously advising people on M&A. And I currently serve on four boards, three financial services companies and one a board of a company that actually makes something or extracts something, a gold and silver mining company. Great. Uh, thanks for having me here. My name's Ken Cotillo. I work for a company called Telephone and Data Systems, TDS. We are a telecommunications service provider, uh, wireline, broadband communications, cable TV systems, uh, wireless systems. We own our largest uh, subsidiaries, U.S. Cellular. You probably know that name. And I've been with them since uh, 03 and actually had a, an FP&A stint with them prior to that. But that's, but I've uh, been pretty much in, in telecom and M&A my whole career. Happy to be here. Happy to talk a little bit about what we do mm. on the uh, Corp Dev and Synergy front. So looking forward to it. So thanks Thank for you. having me. Hi, my name is Dawn White. I'm with Corning Incorporated. I started with them in the Shared Service Center as a project manager. Um, now I work in corporate development in the M&A Integration Center, which we just launched our COE like three years ago. And most of my work focuses on the post-integration side. Perfect. So we're going to just jump into it. Out of these three se sessions or modules, we'll stop and we'll, we'll try to pull some... Uh, uh, questions out of the crowd <clears throat> as we go through it. So why don't we just start right up front is you know, pre-acquisition. Pre we're in the LOI stage or pre-LOI stage. We're trying to define what some of the synergies, cost savings, one-time costs are going to be. Um, so with that, why, why don't we start, Ken, with the corporate dev viewpoint on yeah. sort of, you know, how do you go about, you know, up front? Who do you involve? You know, how yeah. deep in the organization are you looking to, to get some of these items? Okay, let, let me do that. And before I do that, give you a little bit of context on TDS. So we, uh, $5 billion in revenue, We're a company that's been a domestic company, so haven't had to put up with a lot of the international discussion that you guys have been having this last day and a half, but it's complicated stuff. But we, we are built through acquisition. Started 50 years ago with one phone company and over, over the last 50 years, acquired 130 phone companies, 100 plus wireless companies, and uh, several uh, cable TV systems over, over the past several years. 
Uh, so we we um, we tend we don't we don't we're conservative. We don't bet the company. We don't do one two three billion dollar deal. Their equity cap right now is three billion plus. We do a lot of deals in the as low as ten and twenty and thirty million, and then up into the one two three four hundred million. Four hundred million is a big deal for us. So we we, we uh, when I talk about deals, we we tend to be pretty stick close to our knitting. We're gonna we're gonna do geographic expansion of our business. We're going to uh, buy similar businesses, looking to scale up, looking to expand. And uh, some people have been using the term tuck in. So I, a lot of what we do is more tuck in. Um, so that's some of the perspective I bring. Mm -hmm. So when we when we um, when we're looking at a deal, sign an NDA, uh, get our get the sim. We're looking at similar companies many, in many of the cases, right? So we, the financial corp dev types, yes, we involve business unit people virtually day one, but we don't necessarily go out to the full you know, diligence team when we're, when we're talking about getting the SIM and doing an initial evaluation. evaluation. We'll, we'll do some of that with, a, with our more tight-knit crew, get, get a sense for how real is the transaction and we'll be talking to the management team along the way, making sure we have business unit buy-in. If it's all flowing well, we're going to, in, in, in the, um, that, that first phase, we are going to bring in our subject matter experts across all the functional areas as deep as we can. <clears throat> in some cases, um, the, you'll get maybe half the deals. You'll get a sim and they'll say, hey, you know, you got two weeks, you got three weeks, you got four weeks for, for a first round bid, and you got to work off the sim. Maybe half the, uh, another half of the deals, it's, it's you, you can ask any questions you want. Some of them we'll answer, some of them we won't. Uh, we'll give you access to management. And so, of course, whenever we can get more information, whenever we can get access to management, we're going to do it round one and go as deep as we can. And that means we're going to pull in our subject matter experts uh, all, all the sooner. What, what kind of specific synergies are you typically targeting at that point? So revenue. So uh, in our business, um, there, we we centralize and consolidate the operation. Buy a cable company and plug it into our cable system. We buy a phone company, plug it into the the, the uh, telephone company. So the first thing we're going to look for is those I, those areas that we can centralize that are if you want to say the low-hanging fruit. So there's, there's accounting and finance, and, and we're always going to look for the headcount of the companies, because probably half the OPEX is headcount related. So it's, you know, yeah, there's, there's going to be some small synergies related to accounting and finance staff uh, that's going to get centralized. You're, there's going to be uh, synergies related to uh, customer service uh, and billing. Um, and a lot of times the customer service reps are some of the most significant number headcounts mm -hmm. because they're, you know, 10, 10 customer service reps sitting in a market, which we can roll into our sort of national service center, can uh, save, save 10 headcount at the company and maybe only add a couple full-time equivalent headcount back at the ranch, if you will. So there's a example, eight headcount center, full-time equivalent center. A lot synergy. of headcount. Um, so customer service, billing, the marketing and product development stuff, again, tends to be done back at uh, the, the corporate office or the, the business unit office, so there's potential synergy there. Uh, where we, uh, a lot of times in the deals we're doing, remember, we're buying, we just um, signed a cable system out east, $80 million. It has a senior management team. Well, g again, g generally that's going to get rolled into our operations, and most of the senior management um, are, are not going to be around either not even day one or in some cases CFO or financial people be around for a while and it's all it's all laid out yep. up front so there's there's, there's uh, senior management type uh, synergies the, that's that's the call it the, the stuff that gets centralized there are, there are other things we're going to look to but uh, people and operations that are in market those we look closely at, but we very careful with. We're not going to be the, the people have to stay in market. The you know the field techs, the installers, the people that are actually building the networks that we that we operate, they're going to need to stay in market. And typically, when we buy something, we end up 
building it out and enhancing the network. So frankly, not only do we need all those network and install mm -hmm. type people, we need even more in many cases. So, so um, that would be a, early on, there would be a negative synergy. If you're interested in additional information on innovation and M&A, I encourage you to check out the Transaction Advisors Institute, which is a robust source for knowledge on M&A best practice. We host a series of M&A conferences, run an elite M&A academy, offer M&A masterclasses, conduct M&A research, organize the M&A Leadership Council, and publish a prestigious M&A journal. Members of the Transaction Advisors Institute include corporate executives, board members, and private equity investors that are interested in understanding the critical issues impacting transaction planning, structuring, and execution. I encourage you to get more involved in the Institute. Okay, why don't we try a different uh, view from a, from a more of a C-suite board level at this point. What are you typically looking at in you know, a deal making sense of potential cost saving synergies sure. overlaps? Well, I mean, I think first of all, having been reported to boards and also being a board member, I mean, the first thing is most board members look at M&A with a healthy sense of skepticism. And everybody in the room here knows why, because if you look at any of the studies, it's pretty clear that most M&A actually doesn't add value and a lot of it destroys value. And a lot of times when deals are announced, the stock price goes down. Okay, why is that? Because it's risky and it's uncertain and the market hates both of those things. So I look at it as a board member, as a CFO reporting to a board, that I expect the CFO and the management team to have anticipated the questions about what are the risks to the synergies you're presenting, both the revenue synergies in terms of the uplift and the cost synergies in terms of what you can capture and how quickly you can capture it. So to de-risk the deal to get the board to approve it and to get Wall Street to accept it, I think the thing that is uh, most obvious or, or most relevant in terms of providing the level of detail and cadence as to what you expect to do, why it makes sense strategically, and what they can expect in terms of your reporting out and the metrics that they can measure your success by. Now, that's more easily said than done. But certainly to the extent to a board, you can come to them and say, here are the synergies we expect to attain, and here's the timeline in which we expect to attain them. And here's our contingency plans, which I think are very important in case we can't attain everything that we think we can. Um, you know, you can plan as much as you'd like, and I think a lot of what you'll hear from this panel is that a lot of M&A, both planning and integration, is one long project management exercise broken into a series of smaller project management <coughs> exercises. But there is a cadence and a rhythm and a discipline to that that if you can convey to the board and convey to the street, and then as someone said on the previous panel, use what you learn every time you do an acquisition or you do a deal and cycle that back, even though it's painful to go back in a post-mortem and look at your mistakes and say, if I had known that, what would I do differently in terms of diligence? What would I do differently in terms of deal structure? What would I do differently in terms of what I promised to the street and how I conveyed it? That, what the board's looking for is, can you manage the risk associated with this to get a reasonable chance to capture what you expect in terms of synergies and value? And the extent to which you can communicate that crisply, both to your board and to Wall Street, means that they won't be surprised and you'll have a reasonable chance of success, and hopefully the stock price won't go down, at least not initially. I think that level of confidence of having a methodology to capture synergies and to capture value gives the board a sense that they will be reported to on a, a cadence uh, and uh, with metrics that they understand and everyone agrees upon, and the board should hold management accountable to those metrics, and the same is true for Wall Street. Very good, very good. So you're getting a little perspective on it from the deal-making side, the corporate, what the board's looking at. Uh, we're still in the infancy stage here, you know, in the deal-making LOI stage. Don, from a perspective recognizing you, you specialize more in the actual execution of the integration. What are some of your observations up front that, you know, that might be concerning at this point that might not transcend over into the, you know, formal execution of the integration management office? Right, so we typically take the approach where we have like a strategy leader that sits out in the business and he will work with someone from corporate development to draw up the details of the deal, you know, to identify initial uh, synergies. So at that point, 
a little later than the second iteration, they'll bring in some key functional leads to work a little deeper to get that clearer picture. But then we're brought in much later on the integration side. So a lot of times there's a disconnect and the mm -hmm. integration side will come to the table and we're like, where did you get these numbers from? <laughs> so you guys know. And so we are trying to um, fix that by maybe we create like a template, a synergy template that we kind of give to them and say, hey, these are some key synergies that we tackle. Make sure you're looking at that. And so it's a gap we're trying to fix. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I would say as a board member, that's one of the things you should demand is a fair level of detail about what is the plan and who's going to own it. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't, I mean, again, you don't want to cross the line. You're not managing this. You're governing it. But you want some level of detail that you can mm -hmm. hold people accountable to and, and, frankly, pressure test whether or not people have thought through the first 30 or 60 or 90 days and whether or not there are really concrete plans behind it. And I think it's one of the things that good boards will demand in terms of having a really detailed integration plan that, in my view, one person in senior management should own, and that person should be taken off the line and do that 100% of his or her time. Right, I agree, Eileen. And you have so many <coughs> rules around the confidentiality. So just picking who really needs to be at that table. Right. Because probably all the functions want to be at the table, but just making that decision about who really needs to be there in the early stages. Yeah, yeah. you, you got to recognize at this point there's a, um, a, a who's under the tent. And it, it tends to be a, a closer audience because we don't know if the deal's going to go forward. Um, you're here and you got to involve the right subject matter experts, um, but too many cooks in the kitchen uh, means that pretty much the entire restaurant probably knows at this point. So uh, it's probably having the right subject matter experts in for the most critical, largest synergies or cost savings that could happen at that point in time. Um, and trying to frame it up, the, and it would be interesting to hear some viewpoints here of once you identify those, and then you're still in the deal making process how much of those synergies might actually let over into the enterprise value. You know you might save those. You're still trying to get a deal done. Um, you really haven't involved all of the subject matter experts that ultimately are going to come to the table as we get closer to closing the formation of the, the formal integration management office, the owners of the, the, the work streams. So some broad-based assumptions are happening right now. Um, maybe just a, a viewpoint on, have you seen some of that creep over into sure. the enterprise value? Well, I mean, you know, you can kid yourself that you're not paying for synergies, but it's easy to slip into that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't want to do that. I mean, that's the value you're bringing to the deal. That's not the value the enterprise that you're acquiring is bringing. Um, it's a very hot deal market, and so scrutinizing synergies I mean, even if you don't think you're paying for synergies, you're probably paying a pretty high multiple right now. So whether or not the synergies are real, attainable, and on the timeline that you expect to attain them is really critical to valuation. So it's kind of the flip side of your question, which is, you know, everyone will say, I'm not going to pay for synergies. But you're paying top dollar. So the synergies and how real they are are really critical to be able, being able to establish and, frankly, justify your valuation to your shareholders. Yeah, and from a service provider perspective, um, you know, supporting either strategic or financial buyers, you go in there and you're trying to frame up these items up front, either, either being on the buy side or sell side, um, recognizing there's going to be a handoff. You want to be in the zip code. You want to be, you know, close to those numbers. You know you're not going to have the full buy-in at that point in time. So before we transcend into the closing, going from the – you know, like the LOI into, okay, now we can bring more people into the tent. Are there any questions from the audience on, you know, let's call it, you know, the, the upfront setting of, you know, potential cost-saving synergies? When, when you think about, let's, let's make up a number. Let's assume we've said synergy target is, it's a sizable deal, say it's $100 million, just to pick mm -hmm. a number out of the air. It's, um, and we, we're going to assume that they're going to be fully achievable and make it up 18 months, okay? Which, not crazy numbers, okay? Reasonable. Okay, if, you, if 18 months, you would say that's within the range of feasible. When you look at that, eight, the, when in a different deals, what is that going to consist of? When you break that down, how much of that is, in your experience, I'd ask people, typically going to be, you know, people purchasing, Plant consolidation. How, how, when you look at it, how, how does it, 
how do you think about it and how do you actually come up with those numbers when actually you haven't really, you've gone to your board and you haven't really, you haven't done the full, how do you come up with those numbers? Because we've all seen them. Yeah. How do you guys come up with those numbers? Well, let me kick it off here and then we'll go down that. Uh, it, it somewhat depends on the industry. <clears throat> right. So obviously if you're in brick and mortar manufacturing, you got two corporates, you got supply channel, you got production, you got plants. Um, a lot of those are sort of not easy to quantify, but you know you don't need two corporate offices. You know you can consolidate plants. You could rough up some of those numbers. Where it gets a little bit more difficult is the material economics, the labor economics, the sales force, uh, maybe the attrition that might happen with customers or pricing. So, you know, there's, there's, there's no, um, I'd say, roll of thumb or percentages that are going to fall into any of those. It varies by industry. We did this out in uh, California. That was more tech and top line driven. Um, perspective, and I know you're in tech as well. You I, might I, have a I perspective mentioned, on that. you know, back to, I would say on the expense synergy side, it's largely uh, employees. And, and that I think the good news there is you run through the areas, it's, it's pretty easily quantifiable and you just have to execute on it. So it's and uh, many of the synergies, as you say, come pretty quickly. Um, when you start talking about billing systems and whatnot, that can be things that play out over six or 12 or 18 months, and, and you wanna make sure you get th those synergies built in, but it, it takes a little more time. The, the thing that we do, but I don't, we don't really call it synergy, we, or the revenue synergy piece, is we, we look at all the product plans, we look at the price points they're at, Again, we're going to come in and, and enhance the network, so we're going to say, what can, what can we offer that's not being offered today? What kind of upsell can we get in terms of ARPU re revenue? What kind of, maybe there's churn reduction. Uh, what kind of penetration can we increase in the market, you know, increase customers? But the, the trick with that one is um, you can, we can quantify what we did to a model to say, hey, well, I can get such and such up, uplift in ARPU for, in broadband for for the next X number of years. The trick is, of course, you never know what happens. Every, a thousand things are happening every, every week that change pricing and, and, and competition and whatnot. So all you can sort of do on the revenue side is, is take your best crack and then track, am I hitting my sort of my penetrations, my churns, and my ARPUs as months and quarters go by? And you can go, well, maybe I was right. But of course, there are many different factors affecting that. The, the, the ones that are much more quantifiable are those expense synergies that you can identify mm -hmm. in our case. Yeah, I mean, re revenue synergies, you know, it's always easier to say you're gonna cross sell than you are. I mean, it, there are always more difficulties than you expect. I'm, I'm very skeptical of revenue uplift and revenue synergies. Um, and, you know, <coughs> frankly, in a lot of these deals, you lose revenue initially. So you have to, you know, you wanna condition sort of power test or pressure test the deal with, you know, what if we buy this and we lose 10% or 20% of revenue? I mean, in terms of cost synergies, you can be as granular as you want once you get into due diligence. You know, if you're doing a service deal, you lay down all their leases and say, okay, you know, do, can we pull them into our existing office space? How many people in terms of the back office, you know, literally headcount by headcount? I mean, I've seen M&A sort of integration deals that are individual people are identified well before closing in terms of we're not going to need these positions. So, I mean, a lot of that you're going to get in diligence and detail. So if you're willing to be that detailed and go through a very detailed plan, just recognize that, you know, there's an illusion of precision there because you're going to get into the deal and recognize all those IT people you want to get rid of, you can't get rid of right away because they're, they've got some sort of application that only they support. So, I mean, you always have to be a little bit skeptical. I mean, I think the other thing is, you got to realize that the timing of these things will always be different than you assume in terms of synergies. So, you know, trying to have a, a plan but be flexible about it and, and then be honest with yourself about if the synergies don't take 18 months but they take two and a half years or three years, what does that mean for the ROI on the deal? Yeah. I think the mm -hmm. critical aspect quite a bit is building up those assumptions from, from the, the beginning. Up from the bottom up, because that handoff that we're talking about as we go through this progression, uh, someone, someone's gonna have to unbundle that. How did we come up with these initial assessments? Yeah, so let me just follow up for a minute. Yes. So let's assume you've done that exercise. As a board member, as a board member, what discount would you apply to that? If I, you, or, do you, or, 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 or do you expect your management team to apply a discount because you're not gonna be able to do everything you say? 
I think that the management team should apply some discount. That's what you expect them to do, which is, again, pressure test this. This is what you think will happen. What does this deal look like if you put in variables that look different, either in terms of time or the amount that you capture? I mean, I think of it as like an escape hatch. Like, let's just say things go left rather than right, since they always seem to go left rather than right. Tell me what saves this deal. You know, what are the things that you can do to de-risk this if you can't actually operationalize what you're telling me you're trying to do. And I think that sort of thoughtfulness about what are other alternatives to attack this problem to make this work makes me feel much more comfortable as a board member. Right. And from good. the integration side, uh, we like to do synergy summits where we sit down with the functional leads and really drill down into the assumptions just to see where we're really at with that. Mm -hmm. We like to test the model similarly and call it sensitivities or different scenarios mm -hmm. where uh, we're buying a cable company, the, 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 the value is really in the broadband product, right. and yep, there's some vo still some voice revenue rolling in, and that's fine, and the video product's a wild card. So today we have, we, we have nice margin in video, but I, I can imagine it's going in one direction, and so when we're, when we're buying a new company, one of the things we'll do is literally wipe out the gross margin off the video product and see if we still have a business, you know, yeah. and so, and it's That a, it kind of little, thing I think really gives board members a much better sense of like, okay, you think this is going to be great. Tell me what saves this if yeah. things really go downhill. Yeah. And something like that, that kind of really severe sensitivity testing really makes you feel like, okay, I'm, I'm not going to lose my shirt here. Right. I'm going to be able to make this deal work. Yeah. So let's go on to the next phase of, uh, of this. So we, we've gotten through the LOI, we've got the board approval. <coughs> Um, and now we're moving toward the, the sale and purchase agreement, you know, finalization, the closing. So, you know, what's critical at that point is now starting to bring more people under the tent, get more buy-in, uh, more quantification and the support of the potential synergies. Could be working capital as well. Um, so why don't we start there and talk about the formation of um, sort of the initial integration merger, you know, office. IMO. Yeah. Right. Well, I think it's important to start off and have an executive that has the credibility, someone from the C Street with the credibility to be like the face of this integration, mm -hmm. someone that's going back up to your CEO and his team. Um, you got to have a strong integration leader. I think that should also be a senior person that's a part of the IMO. And I also feel that it's important to have the other side at the table to talk about some of the, the plans, the uh, structure around how we're going to integrate this company. And then a little later, you will bring in a whole integration team. Now, at our company, when we say IMO, it, it doesn't necessarily mean everyone that's a part of the integration team. It's that close-knit leadership group that's working together to mitigate problems. They're just not doing administrative duties as far as, you know, checking boxes, right. are you done, status reports. It is that, and it's a cadence we have to that that maybe I can talk about later, but it's also about being the face of the company, talking problems through when there's issues, things that are going to get in the way, bringing it to the table and solving it. Ken? Yeah, I mean, I think we, like you said, we, you, you bring in more experts as needed. You, you start slow, you get into the second round, you pull them in further, and once you have the uh, agreement, and now you're going to work the APA and work on the schedules. You're absolutely hauling everybody in, um, and, it, and it's a team. We don't call it IMO. We mm -hmm. don't, but we, we we like to get a project manager yep. uh, to help lead some mm -hmm. of that. But it's, we need a secret name. Yeah, right? we, I mean, yeah, yeah. 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 Yes. Everybody has to have a little um, acronym. Yeah. It makes it sound fancy. Yeah. yeah. No. Uh, but uh, so it, absolutely, you've got to. One of my things is it's it's a it the. You have to have sort of the quarterback that really coordinates all that yep. and have the right people. And you, and you know, you, you do, if, if you have experience, you know who, who the people are you need by what, what functional area, and those are the people that get brought in. And, uh, you know, you, we do have all of our tra diligence tracking checklists that are getting done, but someone's got to oversee it all and make sure mm -hmm. there's, you know, no balls getting dropped. And the people on that team, I think, have to be senior enough that they can command mm -hmm. the support and change and yeah. movement that needs to be done. They are, as John said, they're <laughs> operating executives. They're not just like saying, okay, I'm doing another spreadsheet now of what's done. Right. They're doing it. Right. They're hands-on. Right. Yeah, in our case, you know, we talk about sponsors for the project right. or whatever. In, in our case, what it is is we don't remember we're sort of doing, we're doing the deals to, to, that will enhance our core business, 
and they're going to get consolidated. We don't, we don't get to an LOI without talking, of course, to the business unit management saying, do you want it? And we can, we can tell just by getting the teaser, we can sort of know, is it, is it a winner or not? If we can, but if it's, if it's going to be serious resources put in place, it's a call right to the business unit head. We got them for you. Take a look at it. You know, are you in? And yeah. we would never buy a company that the head of the business unit didn't want. Okay. Yeah. So, so a lot of times what we see in the, the, this phase of sort of the synergy setting or the execution of it is you, you have the upfront diligence and some assumptions in this formation of, you know, how are we going to execute upon it? And normally you see somewhere around seven to 12 functions you know, function could be, you know, human resource, finance, IT, procurement, et cetera, that sort of fall into what would drive potential synergies, cost savings. And the framework that we're talking about is having someone from the acquiring company, the C-suite, um, or, or someone senior, doesn't necessarily be a C-suite, but to, to take ownership of that, saying, okay, I'm going to steward this along, and then have a steering committee that, you know, sort of meets and drives this, it has a, an executive report in and a measurement of what are these assumptions. So we, we had some broad-based assumptions up front in the LOI. Now we're bringing in you know, functional subject matter experts to develop detailed functional plans. What needs to be done? We heard the story earlier on day one. Well, you know, day one, you know, we, we, we need to you know, turn the lights on. We need to pay the employees. So people all have to have the same right. email, things like that. Well, they got to have the same in email. In professional domain. services, yeah. you want everybody with the same business card. I mean, it depends upon the industry. Like, what are things that just have to be done day one? And, you know, and that'll vary by industry. Of, uh, cash yeah, as right, well, exactly. Billings. So, so this formation, you know, the, the the farther you can bring it upstream, once you get through the LOI, um, and get that ball rolling, it's going to make the the measurement as we go through this story. Uh, much more seamless because the contingency planning that we're talking about, everything is not going to go as initially planned. And you know, you're going to have to say, why, why didn't it go as planned? What did we plan? What was our, our contingency plan? And have that structure in place. So, you know, so where we are in that story now, we're through closing, and now we're going to say, okay, we're executing the, the integration plan. And let's run that story through to say, okay, how's that going to run through? And how are we going to measure? How are we doing? And was this a good action? Let me just on jump. I keep front. backing you yeah. up slightly mm -hmm. here. Yeah. It's like with the, when you say day one closing, the, the good news, bad news in our business. So we, regulated businesses, we often, we many times need FCC approval for our transactions. Sometimes you get into the antitrust issues, but mostly it's FCC. So bad news, you, you need those approvals. The good news is. We sign, a, we sign an APA, it's going to be two, three, four, six months before you're going to close. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. when our integration teams go to work. Right. Because they, 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 it's a signed deal. Now we're just we're working the details. At that point, it's a signed deal. The uh, company, uh, the, the target company, in most cases, is more than happy to work with us. In fact, they often are looking for advice on business decisions. They want, you know, geez, should I, should I be... Uh, buying this regional sports network, what would you do? Or they're, they ask questions just because they generally want to know, and it just so happens that helps us because it helps us sort of direct. Do, do you pull what's them in to be part of the functional leads or just advisory uh, um, at that not point? Not as part of our corporate team and our corporate meetings, but of course there are many meetings with them, but not, not as part of the like IMO, if you yeah, will. Yeah, but. Right, but and they're one, very involved. Right, so one thing we'll do is we'll have a cadence with the integration team. So when I say integration leadership team, that's the integration leader and all of the functional leads, not necessarily the steering team. But so we make sure it's like so like maybe the first six months we're going to come together every other week as a team meeting and as individual functional leads, where each functional lead get 20 minutes to report out on where they are on their status, and if there are any sub teams like sub synergy teams, at that time we'll make sure we hear from them during the team mm -hmm. meeting. So and then after the team meeting, it's a report that's done. That report goes to steering and up to the other higher executive levels. And that's a pattern. Everyone knows it. They expect it. So people come to the table with that cadence. And I think that helps um, so much with keeping everyone informed about what's going on at all times. I think the other thing is, I mean, depending upon the structure of the deal and whether or not you're going to keep senior people, I mean, you can do the sort of Noah's Ark and team people up. 
I mean, if they're going to, if you're going to integrate their business and they're going to run that piece of the business, which is not unusual. I mean, you buy a company, you keep some of the management, or even mid-level people. I mean, they then have skin in the game that they want to make this work, and this is a new company that they're part of. So there are instances in which, even though I'm, you know, you don't necessarily do it in your business, but you know, you're doing a large acquisition where you're going to need some of these people, or you know, even if they're leaving, they know the asset. So you could use them in terms of pairing them up with your own people on these projects. And, and even our, in our situation, many of the many of the employees stay, and some of the senior people right. stay because it's we're, our business is growing, and uh, we need talent. You know, so it's you know, yeah. it's a good way to get some additional. So talent. some of we're hearing here a little bit is maybe you don't put them in a, a key leadership or functional role, but getting them some ownership, direction, buy-in. Yeah. Right. Uh, obviously is going to drive the, the, the target uh, reacting appropriately. And, and if you've got retention issues, you know, you've bought a company, everybody's scared they're going to run. Um, you know, having people from the target in that working group makes people yeah. feel like, okay, mm -hmm. you know, Joe is in this and I know Joe and he's going to speak for me and our view of the, our company is being heard by the acquirer can sort of calm the waters and because you're not going to know, like, who's going to stay and who's not going to, at least initially, and people feel as if, that some of their leadership is being listened to, I think that helps a lot. And, and we definitely don't wait for day one of close we, on yeah. employees. We're talking to employees as soon as possible and uh, you know, make, making offers, letting them know they're going to have a job and letting them know who we are and what we're going to do to improve the company, improve the services, make it better experiences for, for experience for the customer, better experience for the employees. And it you know, usually works out that way. So you definitely don't want... You know, you want to include them on in what's going on. You don't want to just stay silent and yeah. say, "Hey, what's mm -hmm. happening on the close date?" You got, you want to bring them in and talk to them early in and off. And off. Yeah, long periods right. of uncertainty for employees. I mean, they will assume the worst. Yeah. And it, particularly in this environment where everybody, you know, is solicited for jobs all the time, yep. really puts you to a disadvantage. And then to get them to stay, you're going to have to pay them more money in retention, or they'll just say, "I'm not going to have a job full time. Yep. I'll forego retention pay and I'll just go." Yep. Right. We'll we'll make sure that like our, our senior team of the business units are out talking to employees, showing them the love. You know, so it's it's just a a good thing to do. Right. And we've actually found great success with the co-leadership model where we go to the acquired company and we find a representative from each function. Mm -hmm. Of course, their leadership names them and they work side by side with our functional leads. That has did wonders for us. And even putting an implant there, especially when around like a controller, we have all these different reporting expectations that they don't understand. So we'll sit someone on site with them right. to work with them and teach them versus just saying, here, you're responsible to do this. So we saw, we've seen great success Very good. with that. Very good. So we're going to go into the last chapter of that. But for day, any questions on like the day one um, handoff from, from diligence to closing? Before we go into the, probably the more important aspect, can we realize these synergies? Any, any questions? Good. Hi. Uh, Ken, this is a question really for you. Uh, because you mentioned between sign and close, uh, trying to do some of the in integration activities. What sort of structures do you put in place to avoid like, gun jumping, any of that? Because you know, the sign and close could be a while, right? The, diff the, the timing, so. Um. Well, in terms of uh, making sure the company's managed properly and whatnot in the interim? Yeah, so, just that yeah. it's managed independently and you're yes. not influencing sort of decisions mm -hmm. that so what, be so competitive. Usually, we've got a pretty good relationship with management. The deal we're working on now, they're, they're awesome and they, they want our input. Uh, what, but we do put into the APA uh, certain metrics like, you know, you have to... You have to you have to keep spending the same amount of capex, you know, each month and, and, until close. You know, an average amount, uh, so that they're not, you know, uh, taking cash out of the business or you know, stripping stripping cash out. Um, we try to it, it sort of run it business as usual. You can't you can't change product plans. You can't do something um, uh, with, with that's different without talking to us. Mm -hmm. In the in the in the you know, honestly, it usually goes pretty well, and they want want our input, they want our cooperation, um, and so it, ha it hasn't really been a problem in the past. You know, where there may be some current concerns on that front might be on working capital, where right. you know they're yeah. running it, but yeah. there's some working capital measurement that they yeah. can do different things in billing collection, 
um, that will change that true up as yeah, well. So, yeah, so we'll, we'll typically, we, we, at that point, we'll have set a, set a target. Mm -hmm. And so if they're, you know, if they're, um, if, they're pay, if they're collecting all their receivables or, or running up payables, it's, it's going to come out in the wash one way or another. Um, in terms of the calculations we run, so they can't they can't manipulate it um, in, on, on one side. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Um, just to respond to that question, maybe an idea. In my prior life as a consultant, when we worked on um, mergers uh, with a kind of long period between sign and close, um, we would work in a clean team capacity. Um, basically, you know, we would collect all the sensitive data, like detailing cross-sell synergies. I mean, with literally like customer level and kind of product sales that nobody can really look at across companies, but we can. We would agree on the methodology, kind of how we are thinking about this synergy, where the synergy is really coming from, so we can drill down to almost like the account level, what, what, what's new will be bringing to them. And we would do the work um, and then kind of present high level, okay, here's what we're seeing. This, X million dollars, here's the execution steps, but you know, so you make a lot of progress without really sensitive data crossing boundaries. Interesting. Excellent point. The clean room, um, yeah. and we, we find ourselves as advisors you know, in that clean room, um, and at the appropriate time you hand the keys over to un you know, unmask that, um, it still goes back to then the handoff. Were the right assumptions made? Does right. management own that at that point in time? So let's talk about the, the realization of synergies, because this is really where uh, this model falls down sometimes. You know, we, we, we've struck the deal, we closed the deal. Um, let's talk about, we always hear the first 100 days. You know, what's going to happen in the first 100 days? How do we go about that? Um, and maybe we start with the actual um, execution yeah, we have, of... We have done do we'll all just, that. We'll just walk down the line here, um, because it's going to ultimately come over to the board of you're asking... How am I looking at this? Right. So for the first 100 days, we start off with charters, number one. Each function will have a charter, which will outline um, the different synergies that they are to capture, outline potential issues, assumptions, and we have a milestone summary where key milestones are called out with expected due dates. Um, and we try to hold them to that and just keeping that cadence of coming back, looking at that. And if something is off there, seeing what we can do to fix that, like why is it off? Do we need to put extra people here? Uh, is it something uh, that's going on in the acquired company that's preventing us from reaching that target? Uh, so th that's one thing that we do. Yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's executing the plan. It's, mm -hmm. um, if you've got the strategy right and the integration right, you're setting yourself up for success. So you're monitoring all this yes. with the integration team to make sure we're not missing, you know, not dropping the ball, not missing those, those targets. Uh, because if, if, if that's the way we're going to allow our product and marketing team to sell more services, generate more revenue, or, you know, get the network in place for it. So it's, it's, uh, it's executing, when you say the first 100 days or whatever, it's you're executing on that, on that plan you, you yeah. said you were going to... De devil's in the detail there, obviously. De devil's is, in the detail. How detailed are the functional plans? The interplays yes, between the function is one, you know, sort of a, a you know, critical step to the next. Right. Um, so the broad base assumptions into the, the detailed functional plans and the execution of those. Yeah. That's what I'm hearing right. there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. And we'll even do a, a special training session. It's not just a kickoff, but we realize we have some functional leaders that are very experienced and others that are new. So each integration will have a kickoff with two days of learning the corny way, learning how do we track these synergies, learning what should you be doing or not doing on this deal. Then the third day, <laughs> together as a team, digging deep and, and talking about all those things. So we found great success with that too, yeah. Very good. How about from the board perspective well, at this point? Well, I think it's really, you know, what are the expectations you set when you ask for board approval? I mean, the board should be saying, okay, when are you going to report back to us and in what detail and in <coughs> what cadence? And that expectation is that the board has to demand what they want and what they're comfortable with. And the other part of this, I mean, obviously that's going to be much more detailed than what you tell the street. But again, uh, I think your opportunity to have a good reception to your announcement of an acquisition, the ongoing integration, is increased to the extent that you can be transparent and provide milestones that you then hit. 
So, you know, on the one hand, you don't want to box yourself in because there's a lot of unknowns. On the other hand, you know, frankly, the board should demand what the reporting is going to be so there's no, there's no sort of surprises when they're not receiving things that they expected to receive. So management and the board says grace over how the deal is going to be reported, what they should expect in the first, second, and third quarter and onwards. And I think that's true for the street as well. They're going to ask the questions even if you don't provide the information. So you might as well use the opportunity to say you should know this is how we intend to report out. You know, will this be fully integrated? Is it going to be ring fenced because there's an earnout? How will we have some idea what will success look like? And how will I know in the P&L and on the balance sheet what that looks like as a shareholder? So from a measurement, I help try to find some, some metrics. So, you know, we, we could look at EBITDA, you know, you know, one plus one, and we were going to take so much cost out. Or we could look at top line revenue. We could look at working capital uh, in terms of, you know, combining where we able to take something out, earnings per share. Um, so there are various metrics, but, you know, the, it, it's always a little vague. And you it's know, lagging. Po and it's lagging. <coughs> yeah. Post deal, you look back and you say, was I successful? Did I realize those synergies? Yep. How disciplined do you feel that really is in your organizations, or, or a hypothetical organization, <laughs> based upon your experience? I mean, uh, we we do that, and of course, it's if it's a small deal. Honestly, it's not going to get stuck in. Yeah. It, right. Not that the board doesn't see yeah. it and approve it, or even if they don't need to formally approve it, we still show it to them. But I'm talking about ongoing evaluate you know, reviews. Larger deals, they're going to see a, a follow up. The, one of the interesting things, though, that we do, again, we consolidate everything. So um, what happens is when we, when we consolidate centralized functions, I, I, I can get your revenues by product, I can get your customer data, I can get your churn data, you know, ARPUs, what's happening to the products. I, so I can get your revenue, I can get your gross pro, uh, COGS and gross profit. Once I get below gross profit, a bunch of those costs have now been centralized. So the way we end up running that is we... We have allocations based on revenue, based on customers, various accounting metrics that push costs for billing, for what whatnot. Mm -hmm. So you not you can see a financial statement off my new company I just bought, but a bunch of those are allocated costs, not they're not direct costs. And that's and that's okay because that allowed us to achieve synergy. Right. So it's not bad, but it's not actually direct costs. So I guess my point there is what we're looking at is you should you want to make sure you get the synergy and the analysis right to get from the get go because you're going to lose visibility to some of that going forward. So right. you want to be, you want to not fool yourself. But when you talk about really reviewing it, you're you're going to look at revenues through gross profit and customer metrics and network yeah. metrics and data like that and, and activity metrics. I mean, activity. we were going to close these many offices. Did they get closed? Yeah. Did they get closed on time? I mean, even if you're delayed in terms of how what flows through your P and L, eventually those are going to show up. So the things that you said you were going to do on an activity basis, that's a proxy for saying when is this going to show up in the P&L because it's always yeah. lagging. Yeah. These are the things, the activity metrics that we set. These are the, this is the timeline. These are the milestones. Yeah. Did we hit them and why didn't we if we did not? And that's what you need to cycle back through your next deal. Because at the end of the day, you know, there are all sorts of industries that basically have no organic growth or not much. And they have to get growth through acquisition. The people who develop, as the earlier panel said, that muscle memory of, learning continuously how to do things better are the people who get credit by the street when they're doing acquisitions. Yes, and we started a process where we go back and look at performance summary reports. We ask the business to uh, keep track for three to five years of acquisition, and we're mm -hmm. looking at all the wow. lines. Yep. So, Most people aren't great. that disciplined. It's painful to go back and look <laughs> yeah. at your mistakes. We're doing it. Painful. It's and we're lessons it's, learned because yeah. we want to yeah. understand where are we going wrong here. Yeah. yeah. So some of the lessons you're hearing here is, look, yeah, up front, have you know, the right appropriate subject matter experts involved in the early stages to frame up the costs to achieve, the synergies, uh, which buckets they go into, recognizing they're going to get scrutinized as they go down the, the process. You know, establishing a, a functional, depending on the size, even a tuck-in needs the same discipline. Absolutely. But a, a, a very disciplined approach to a management office, you know, in terms of what are the key functions, what are the work plans, what are the interdependencies. Inter and I've also heard, you know, senior ownership is, you know, you just can't assume that this is going to go forward. There's going to have to be a, a senior uh, executive 
from the acquiring company to maybe go offline for a while, take ownership of this process. Um, you know, uh, other items, take key takeaways from each of you? I mean, I would just say I think setting expectations both with the board and with your shareholders of what they should expect to see going forward related to the acquisition. And to your point, you know, there's only so much in terms of detail that you can break out in the P&L. And part of that is because you've been successful at integrating it. But setting those expectations up front, I mean, I think yep. gives you credibility and a greater likelihood that they will give you the benefit of the doubt. Yep. 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 And I will say uh, segment and prioritize your synergies. Go for the low-hanging fruit right. first, right? Uh, communicate synergy status often to everyone on the team. And then just protect the base business. Yeah. Don't, Do you don't feel mess it's critical it. to have early wins in the Absolutely. process? Absolutely. It helps to keep the team motivated yeah, and energized yeah. and keep you tracking. Absolutely. I yeah. think that's really important. What are the synergies that are big and easy to get? Those, yeah. you know, they have to be in the upper right quadrant. Go for those first. Amen. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. So <clears throat> open it up for questions on the, from the audience in terms of any from, anything from you know, the set, setting of the synergies to you know, the management of them at this point. Hey, this is a, a question for Don. Um, Don, when you set up the integration management office and as you're going through the process, how do you protect against legacy strategic initiatives that are coming into conflict with the integration priority and main, maintaining resource visibility so you understand where key resources, making sure they're allocated on integration, assuming it's the number one priority? Well, with our organization, we have already identified people up front that we know will be a part of that. So that helps to protect them, even at that point, because we know these people are designated when, we, when it's time to go, they're going to be a part of the IMO or the integration leadership team. So just having that governance and structure in place ahead of time, leveraging the leadership from our center of excellence to work with the business leadership to make sure this is all understood and agreed upon early on has been the key there. You're talking a little bit about ongoing cost savings initiatives that were coming down the pike on top of mm this merger integration, they almost come together at that point. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's a leadership issue. Yeah, I mean, that's really the CEO yeah. has to be clear about what, which of these things Priorities. are most important and on what timeline. Well, yeah. the answer is you're going to take credit for them in the oh, right. merger integration <laughs> office. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, other questions? Yeah, here, uh, I'm Bill Johnson. Hey, so kind of an observation and a question. We talk about syn synergies, and there's a lot of focus on that. There, you also need to be aware of dis-synergies. That you're a lean organization buying a leaner organization, and yep. you find that they're under under equipped for doing some of the things the way that a TDS might want to do it. Yep. Where you find the acquired company doesn't have the respect for environmental health mm -hmm. and safety, that sort of thing that the company does. Any just any comments on experiences along those lines? Uh, and, and for TDS, a couple examples would be on the network side. We, we tend to build really nice networks. And so almost always when we get in, the, we need to upgrade the network and we need to upgrade the, the, the staff, if you will. The, the, and so that, that's a dis-synergy because we're going to add people and probably add, you know, add higher price talent and whatnot. The other thing, another example on my cable deal is um, uh, content, video content. Is almost always a dis-synergy in that we tend to offer um, uh, better packages. So now, so I've, I've just increased my cost. I know that if I, I add some channels. Now the question is, can I get the revenue for it? So first thing we quantify is, well, geez, that we're adding three bucks a sub in content. Okay, we, we've either, what did that just, that cost me X millions of dollars of NPV, and I got to know that. Of course, I try to make up for it on my, my revenues. But a couple quick ones that come to mind are content or the network network folks. And I think the other thing is you have to decide at some point in due diligence when you presumably find that stuff, you know, whether or not that's a haircut devaluation or a deal killer. You know, is that, that going to impound so much right. risk in the deal that it's really not worth doing it because you're going to have to add so much more back to it or there's so much unknown in terms of the risk inherent in the way they've run the business that you really don't want to assume that. And you know, yeah. one of those big black holes is compliance, environmental. 
because, as you know, you can do diligence that forever, and you don't really know the full extent of it until you get in there. Some of that you can maybe manage through talking to your regulators, but um, you know that's a question of not just paying less, but is this something that could risk the base business, as Dawn would say. Right, and that's another reason to do some type of cultural assessment, to understand how they work, how do they behave, how do they tick. Because some things you can identify up front that you know you may have gaps with to help you prepare. Let's yeah. go back to that carve-out panel a little bit. Is what, what is being presented to you? Um, you got to sort of look at it on, on a, what would that be on a standalone basis? Are they running the way we would run that company? You would hope to flesh that out in the diligence aspect, maybe have it in the negotiation of the purchase price. Uh, that, yeah. that will be, you know, in, 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 look at uh, manufacturing plants, you know, industrial hygienics, you know, yeah. you know, the way they take care of their plants and the way you may, may do that, or IT infrastructure. Um, that's the time to make that argument. Once you get past that, then you're left saying, okay, I have already baked that into the enterprise value of what I'm willing to, to pay at that point. And then it really comes over to how am I going to implement it and backfill those positions? And what's my scalability of my, my, my platform? And that gets into your point is now I'm adding more cost structure to my infrastructure. Uh, not necessarily what I bought, but my infrastructure to handle that. Mm -hmm. um, does that get lost into the measurement of the synergy? Uh, my, my viewpoint, you know, sometimes it does, uh, but if you had that well thought out in advance in the diligence mm -hmm. aspect, it got fed into the what is my tracker by function, mm -hmm. that should be reported up uh, in the overall numbers. Hey, back here. Yeah, hi, this is Abhishek Jain from Schneider Electric. Uh, I, I would say it's more of a comment than a question. Uh, while we are kind of quite focused on integration and achieving synergy, uh, I believe there is a tendency on kind of on the deal profession side, as we don't have view to the market, we might be missing some mega trend or, or some disruptive trend, which could be hitting the business. And, and because we are so inwardly looking, our eyes are off it. So we, we, we need some mechanism to kind of keep this uh, process also nimble enough and, and flexible yeah. enough to pivot uh, the, the, the integration and, and kind of quickly adapt to the market needs. Well, that's one of the reasons why Wall Street doesn't like deals, because they think you're going to be consumed by a deal and maybe missing out on new product innovation and other things. And you'll, you'll see that in reports by, you know, buy-side analysts. So this company is going to be tied up with this integration for the next two years. They're going to be vulnerable on new product innovation and the rest of it. I think that's exactly right. Uh, I mean, it's important, and it has to have the full focus of the board and management. And that's the idea of putting a senior person in to really own the integration. Mm -hmm. But it can't consume you completely because you've got to run the base business. And that's there's right. a lot of innovation. If you're not staying on top of it, you're just focused on integration. You're going to miss things. Right. And we'll change up the pace of the integration to make sure we're not interfering with the business priorities. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Very good. I appreciate your, uh, your time today. Thank you. Good.